Welcome to the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, featuring stellar conversations with emerging and established Wickedly Smart Women. Thanks for joining us today as we celebrate women who are committed, care deeply, and have the courage to take action and create conscious change all around the world. Now here's your Wickedly Smart host, Angel B. Hartwell. Welcome to another episode of the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, where we celebrate Wickedly Smart Women and provide our listeners with a wealth of wisdom, along with immediately actionable steps to be smarter, spunkier, and more successful in their impact and their leadership. This is your host, Angel B. Hartwell, and today we welcome our very special guest, Katrina Breeze. Katrina is an artist and activist. She lives in New Orleans, where she is a parade producer in the Mardi Gras industry. After losing her mother to an impulsive gun suicide, Katrina turned her focus to protecting others from such a tragedy. Through Donna's Law, those who feel they are vulnerable to impulsive gun purchases may opt out voluntarily. Donna's Law has recently been passed in three states and is being considered nationwide. I am super delighted to have you here on the show with me today, Katrina. Welcome to Wickedly Smart Women. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, um, before we got started, Katrina was telling me that she's been a listener. So I'm really delighted that a listener has now turned into a guest. And, you know, you have obviously had a challenging journey. So I'd love to have you speak a little bit about your backstory What inspired you to start to become an advocate? Sure. Um, I had always been really opinionated and judgmental about society. (laughs) (laughs) And so I think that as soon as I could talk, I was probably advocating for things that I believed in. And um, I had learned a lot about advocacy work in the Mardi Gras industry and Um, There's a lot of politics in Mardi Gras, and it is a a very um, tight-knit, conservative community. And so learning to navigate and advocate for my business as a artist, but also um, as someone that wanted to be part of the culture. So that was um, some of the first advocacy that I learned was through that. And then um, after I lost my mom... I felt like there was so much energy inside of me of the grief and the tragedy and the trauma. And it actually felt like I was manufacturing something like the, the way that my body was like producing it um, all day, all night, nonstop. But it was this thing that had no value. And as an entrepreneur and a creative and someone who loves to upcycle and um, make things from, you know, turn trash into treasure in my art, it felt like I have to put this this fire into something. Otherwise, it could be um, self-destructive. Mm-hmm. And I had witnessed a lot of loved ones and friends have self-destructive tendencies after experiencing losses, um, uh, things like, um, you know, alcoholism or excessive spending or promiscuity or um, all kinds of things that that can derail someone when they're trying to, I guess, feel a little bit better in that in that horrific moment. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that I had to do something that was going to take take this energy and and put it somewhere valuable and safe. And immediately upon learning about her death, I pretty much conceived what this legislation would end up becoming because I did not understand how my mother could purchase a gun because she had just been inpatient psychiatric hospital for three times in a row and she was under psychiatric care and i just didn't understand how she was able to get a gun so quickly and at that point i started talking to 
a woman named Victoria Coy that is in my Mardi Gras dance troupe where we're part of a group called the Bearded Oysters. And she had recently been appointed to be a director of gun violence prevention for Amnesty International. And I love the practice of Women Crush Wednesday. And right before my mom died, I had sent her an email about how much I appreciated the work she was doing and just encouraging her and wishing her a happy Women Crush Wednesday. And then maybe two weeks later, I'm reaching out to her again, telling her that this happened to our family mm-hmm. and that um, I it it was so unsettling in so many ways. But there was this giant feeling of wanting this to never happen to somebody else Mm. because it was so preventable. And Victoria was able to conceive the um, original legislation that we worked with. Um, Later on, we started working with a professor named Fred Bars from the University of Alabama, who had also been working on the same type of legislation years before us. And and then I was able to partner with Fred and um, Victoria and, and bring this forward. And got it passed in three states. How beautiful is that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we also recently lost in 22 <laughs> states, which I'm kind of proud of. Lost in 22 states, but yeah. you're, you're, you haven't lost. You just are, are have a speed bump on the path right, to, to right. winning. Yeah, right. we'll be just back. speed bumps on the path to winning. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I want to talk a little bit for those listeners who may not understand the whole um, concept of advocacy. I'd love to have you just take and give us a bigger like bird's eye view of advocacy in general and some of the skills and some of the um, maybe reasons why people would want to activate the inner advocate in their own life. Sure. Um, Sometimes I think of advocacy as just as simple as putting, attaching a mouth and a voice to something you care about. And that can be email, voice, it can be having conversations. Um, I'd say the the first step of advocacy is knowing what your goals are, um, understanding what is possible to achieve, what what your expectations could be, how you're going to build alliances to help you get that. Um, whether it's doing work nationally for legislation or, let's say, someone in the doctor's office just trying to Um, make sure that they get all their symptoms addressed. Um, Advocacy is important to learn um, throughout our lives, every level, Um, even advocating for other people is so important. I'm able to advocate for a lot of people that have suicidality, a lot of people that are no longer here. Mm -hmm. And so I'm able to give them a voice and um, that, that means so much to me because the people who really need this are so silenced. A lot of them Mm. have bipolar disorder and there's so much stigma and it's really scary. And it's also hard for people to attach their identity to a cause like this. Um, And my mother is also able to um, use her legacy legacy to be an advocate. I kind of think of her as an organ donor and that upon her death, like her body can be used as um, a way for people to bring compassion and a real story to this cause. And there's so few families that feel comfortable coming forward after suicide mm. so i feel like i get to um be a voice for them and th- that's just such a, a wonderful feeling to be able to you know have the microphone and 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 um be heard and vocalize and make change mm. i love that well and you know i think women in particular we are just in the last maybe three decades, really finding our voices and really, I mean, I'm not going to, um, you know, I'm not going to say that there haven't been women all throughout history that have actively used their voices to serve, uh, you know, society in a number of different ways. 
and women in particular have mostly been suppressed. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious for you, when you started advocating, what kinds of pushback you might have had to deal with either in your own family or your community um, or internally that you yeah. had to overcome? Yeah, there was a lot. Um, my family wasn't interested in this. They did not understand it at all. They didn't think that it would be successful. They thought it would be unhealthy for me to pursue it. I also got a lot of resistance from gun violence prevention groups that didn't really understand what I was talking about. It was a new idea. They already had their initiatives laid out um, for th for their year and what they're going to be working on. Um, obviously, the NRA has been resistant to this. Um, and I, I've pretty much gotten resistance on every level. I mean, now that I'm thinking about it, I've gotten it from psychiatrists, I've gotten it from police. Um, and but slowly, they've all gotten on board. And one of the cool things about this work is that I get to do it over and over until I get it right. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when I really do get it right, when I really do build the team of all those national um, suicide prevention groups and gun rights groups and gun violence prevention groups, that it that I will win and that each legislative session is a chance for me to develop more allies. Um, I think that a big part of, to your point about women having a difficult time advocating, I think that one of the first steps of advocacy work is being entitled and like actually feeling that you are entitled to do this work with your time to use your voice, to use your resources, to use whatever you want for the cause that you are believing in and you can have multiple causes and you can quit them later and work on different ones but feeling entitled that if you're feeling passionate about something and you are a person that is um creative and solutions based that you you can bring a lot of value to a lot of causes um the skill set of entrepreneurs, being creative, being problem solvers. These are the traits that we need people to have in every kind of lane in society. And when I first started doing this work and talking to people in politics, I didn't understand where my place was because I wasn't a lobbyist and I didn't know the word advocate yet. And I would literally say, I'm a citizen. They'd be like, who are you? And I'd say, I'm a citizen. <laughs> and um, and then I learned that I didn't have to come there alone. I made um, alliances. I like to think of politics as making friends that every um, strange bedfellow that you connect with is a new friend and mm -hmm. that each time I get to go to a different capital is an opportunity for me to make friends and to trade compassion mm -hmm. for for their community to whether wherever I am I mean right now I have Kentucky on my mind because we've been working there but to really think about the um the value that that could bring to kentuckians and also to feel compassion for people who feel fear about this legislation um mm -hmm. the way this legislation works i'm is gonna it, I'm, we're gonna sure. take a quick break and we're gonna talk about that on the other side of the break so i want to just stop you right there katrina but we will come right back wickedly smart women uh, after the break and get more details on the way this legislation works right now though we could use your help. If you're enjoying this show, please consider making a donation at wickedlysmartwomen.com, joining our community and sharing with your lovely lady friends that might benefit from our content. Help a gal out and let your sisters, mothers, daughters, friends, and colleagues know about the show so that we can serve them too. I want to say a huge thank you to all of our listeners who are downloading, rating, and reviewing. We are welcoming thousands and thousands of downloads from all around the world. And I want to shout out this week to our listeners in New Orleans. 
Might as well shout out to our listeners there. And we will shout out also to our listeners in New Zealand and the Netherlands. We'll just do all the ends today. And we will be right back with Katrina Breeze. The Wickedly Smart Women podcast is brought to you by the Wealthy Life Mentor. Women, are you on the edge knowing that life is calling you to make a change? Are you ready to be part of the evolution of what it means to be a wickedly smart woman creating your wealthy life by design, a life that is an extraordinary work of art? Angel B. Hartwell, the Wealthy Life Mentor, is hired by women in transition, women just like you who want to break through to their brilliance, become clear on the value of their wisdom, and embody a beauty-filled, balanced life of shameless self-expression. Discover your wealthy life readiness by taking the quiz at quiz.wealthylifementor.com. And we are back with Katrina Breeze. Before we went to the break, we said we would let you know where you can find out more about Donna's Law, and uh, she's going to tell us how the law works. You can go to Donna's Law dot com and when they get there katrina which we're going to have that for you in the show notes when they get there katrina what are they going to find and can you tell us a little bit about how donna's law works sure um donna the way donna's law works is it enables people to voluntarily opt out of their ability to purchase a gun and it is reversible so in most states there is no barrier for someone to purchase a gun there's no waiting period Um, In my mother's case, she had never had a gun before. She Googled how to kill herself, and then it was recommended to buy a handgun, and then where that gun store was, and then directions to the gun store. And my mother had just come out of psychiatric care to prevent suicide. Um, So for someone like my mother, who was on top of her care and self-advocated and followed her doctor's orders and wanted to preserve her life, this could have been something that could have saved her life. And it's currently available to people in Washington State, Virginia, and Utah. They can sign up. Um, It does not interfere with the Second Amendment. It is totally confidential. This is completely voluntary. It only has to do with the person signing up. It is not connected to any kind of mental health diagnosis. Anybody can sign up. Um, Most suicides are by gun and most gun deaths are suicides. So this enables us to make a huge dent in the gun violence that's happening within our country without stepping on anyone's toes about the second amendment Mm. um, because it's totally voluntary so it's a a fairly new concept it is gaining a lot of support if people want to go to donnaslaw.com they will find a model bill they'll find a lot of publicity about the law different videos explaining how it works there's a lot of information about how you can connect and bring that legislation to your state so there's things there like how to write an op-ed how to contact with your legislator i'm also behind the scenes on that website so anything you type into that website will come directly to me and i will respond to i really appreciate people just coming on and saying like hey this is the state i live in i would like to bring this here what can i do Mm -hmm. and i promise to not shame anybody about not knowing who their reps are (laughs) i will just find out who your reps are and send them an email on your behalf and um, we can get started in their state beautiful i love that so since you mentioned that you are behind the whole thing right um You know, most of the time I'm talking to entrepreneurs, but this is a nonprofit type of thing, I'm sure. Correct? Or is it completely Um, voluntary or help me understand like the monetization? Right. Um, (laughs) It's 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 nothing. It's a um, a group of people that care. Mm -hmm. Uh, We don't have any status. It has um, evolved just working as a team without that. Mm -hmm. Um, There's we would love to be adopted by a larger organization at some point. 
right, right now it's funded by donations. Um, the main cost or yeah, the main cost for me is traveling mm -hmm. to different states and being able to testify and meet with legislators and bring the um, the right strength to the hearings um, mm -hmm. through traveling to those places. And so that that is a yeah that's what's going on with that it doesn't um i don't really envision having a nonprofit mm -hmm. i i don't really have that dream to run mm -hmm. a nonprofit i know mm -hmm. that it's a lot of work just within mm -hmm. that i i actually am an entrepreneur as an artist and mm -hmm. um i have been trying to think about okay i made this really weird magical career with my entrepreneurial mm -hmm. dreams 20 years ago that i wanted to ride unicorn floats and mardi gras and i made that happen and so maybe i can make this happen too and so i'm starting to try and figure out what are the products and services that i can mm -hmm. provide that support this work that might have more specific value. And mm. I hope um, some of them in the future are, let's say, speaking to medical professionals about how to use the tool in their states, mm. things like that. Um, I would love to talk to other families about how to make laws, whatever it is. Like when I'm a creative, so anytime someone tells me the name of someone that they lost to some unfortunate reason, I immediately just like put the word law after that. And I mm. think about like, what could it mean? What could that legacy become to be able to donate that person's death to a legislator that has a initiative that could be very positive for that situation? Um, really powerful, really powerful. I The whole concept of donating someone's death, that just to me, just sends the shivers up and down my spine as your woman, woman manifesting over there. I think that's the word that you used. So I, in the last few minutes that we have, there's a couple of questions that like one little piece of clarification when somebody signs up for, for this and opts out, it, does it go into some kind of registry or something so that, that uh, a gun store is going to say oh you opted out yeah yes. okay great so the way that works is there's a NIC system already which is the federal background check system and it's managed by the fbi so this enables a voluntary entrance into that system okay great all right well so the other thing i want to talk with you about is you know you did mention you're an entrepreneur so i'm curious how do you navigate when you're like wholeheartedly advocating for Donna's law and at the same time you're running your own business and working to, you know, put the roof over your head and all the rest of that. What are some of the challenges that you may have faced and how have you helped yourself to continue to maintain your devotion to the advocacy and your devotion to your own well-being financially? Yeah, um, I think that a lot has to do with trust, that I've learned to trust that there is a place in society and a place in capitalism for people like me that are doing really good work and that society hopefully will hold us up. And so far that's been true and I just appreciate that so much and learning to, learning to just trust fall into that has mm -hmm. been beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also constantly trying to use my creativity to come up with ways to make money in the channels. And I'm not there yet, but I also have know that it takes time to build mm -hmm. those things. Mm -hmm. And I plan to build those things. One of the things that I'm building right now is called the Grief Relief Card Deck. Uh -huh. And it is 55 prompts of things to do that are for your mental health. And I hope to bring that to different organizations. I last week had a meeting with the Veterans Affairs organization to see if I can bring a workshop into their organization and the deck and have um and also, I would love to work with organizations like hospice to bring that deck. And so uh, there is a lot of trust and there's a lot of trust in my faith um, 
in society and also my faith in myself to be an entrepreneur. Mm, I love that. I love that. Well, I want to talk briefly about, um, you know, your own navigating of the grief and how powerful it has been for you to channel it into something really productive. And I'd just love to have you, if you would mind, take us back, you know, to the beginning when you made the decision to do this advocacy work. What did you do to support yourself internally to keep saying, Yes. And to ch- like, really, you're channeling the grief energy, you're transmuting the grief energy into the advocacy. So I'd love to hear, like, what did you have for support? Did you have outside supporters? Like we talked about the people who were resisting what you're trying to do, but did you have a team of supporters? Do you have a spiritual team that you work with? You know, what are some of the things that you've done internally to continue to have the courage to be a conscious change agent in the world? Sure. Um, I have tried and succeeded in so many different types of healing therapies. Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of generous healers reach out to me and offer support. Um, The leaning into the community of gun violence, survivor advocacy, and suicide prevention has also opened up a world of all these people that understand what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. And my work in Mardi Gras parades was just really about like being fun and showing people the time of their life and suppressing a lot of these emotions that I was Mm -hmm. going through. So the, the work has provided that space for me to be open about it and find a lot of support. Um, I have learned to live with it more than I think I've learned to heal. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, In the beginning of this work, I wanted people to see me as someone that had a big trauma and then found healing through legislation. And that seemed like a really great fairy tale and that people would be inspired by that. And now I realize that What's even more inspiring is that I was able to do it while I was really broken Mm -hmm. and that sometimes it's really the only thing I'm able to do. Like there's a lot of days where I, I I like literally cannot take a shower. I cannot brush my hair. I can, I have dirty fingernails. Like every, every piece of my like personal hygiene is behind schedule. And for some reason I'm able to send the emails to legislators. And so in those times I've found a way to still be powerful, still be kind of going upstream on the problem that, that I'm facing. And um, I think that, the these types of traumas they don't you don't really heal from them and you just learn to live your life and have a different lifestyle and have different types of people around you and sometimes that means doing really different kinds of work Mm -hmm. and shifting um what is your new entrepreneurial dream career beautiful All right. Well, thank you so much for being just so powerful, Katrina, at all that you are doing and all that you are navigating. Listeners, we love feedback. Please let us know what you thought of today's episode. Go right now to wickedlysmartwomen.com to join our community, share your takeaways, ask questions, or submit guest suggestions. Thanks so much for tuning in. Keep your ears open. And remember, you are a wonderful woman. Thanks for tuning in, downloading, and listening. Be sure to rate and review Wickedly Smart Women on Apple Podcasts and share with other women who can benefit from today's episode. Wickedly Smart Women is the premier podcast series for informing, activating, and inspiring the leader who carries profound wisdom and knows that now is the time to welcome wealth. We welcome your feedback and guest suggestions and invite you to subscribe to our mailing list to be notified of each new episode at wickedlysmartwomen.com.